Um, today, this afternoon, is perhaps a time of, of great joy and uh, the alleviance of suffering for many millions of people. Uh, sadly, the news is not that the FSA has conceded ground on with profits and mutual insurance, but we live for that day. Sadly, neither am I reporting that um, Greece has managed to find out a bailout solution which saves the euro. But perhaps almost as importantly, in terms of this conflict-driven world, uh, I can tell you that on the BBC a few minutes ago, they announced that Colonel Gaddafi had been killed. And if I say nothing else this afternoon, well, at least I've given you some new information. The um, Association of Financial Mutuals uh, was born at the beginning of last year and brings together um, representation of mutual insurers and friendly societies. And between our members, they have around about 20 million policyholders and assets approaching 100 billion pounds. Those of you that are keen followers of mutuality will know that before the welfare state was created, if somebody wanted to save for the future, to plan for the pension, to protect themselves against not being able to work, or even to find the money to bury themselves, they would go to a mutual insurer or friendly society to do that. And even up until the 1990s, the mutual insurance sector was dominant in the UK, with many of the big names that we know today still being under mutual ownership. Now, what we saw since about 1995 onwards is government policy uh, through a succession of governments and indeed a succession of regulators um, push towards demutualization, not just in building societies, but also in mutual insurance. Uh, so nowadays we see a sector that only has around about 5% of the UK insurance market. We still see some of the bias that was inherent in uh, the way that regulators operated working today in the FSA. Now that's not um, explicit bias, but it is bias towards uh, single business models which rely on equity capital. We think that's wrong and we think that um, more needs to be done through the FSA and through its successor organisations to uh, encourage the growth of diverse business models and of course in particular mutuals and cooperatives. Now I should just say in fairness over the last few months we have seen a more enlightened approach within parts of the FSA where there is a real determined effort as Martin mentioned with the appointment of Eleanor Linton to make sure that uh, mutual insurance is better understood and that uh, the, the supervisors and the policy people in the FSA take account of the mutual model when developing new rules. But whilst we're in a position of change as a result of new legislation in the UK, we're also seeing significant change in the reg regulatory environment simply because of the impact of Europe. So whether or not the FSA was splitting itself in two, actually what we would be seeing in the future is a far different regulatory framework than the one we have today. Because more and more, uh, the European regulators are, are setting the regulatory climate and the rule book, and that means that the FSA and its successors are very much more implementers of policy than they are developers of it. And that means that not just we as an industry, but also the regulators themselves have to come to terms with the new approach that's being pushed on them. FSA talk about that in terms of more intrusive regulation or judgment-led regulation. Well, again, that to me is part of the implication of seeing the rules set elsewhere. And I have to say, it's interesting that in Europe they've decided that regulation should be split according to functional lines, uh, banking, insurance and markets, whereas in the UK we've gone along different uh, prudential and conduct of business lines. And, uh, and that will make the whole environment for regulation in the UK far more complicated. Now that invariably means for small mutual organisations uh, there are more chances of getting more things wrong. Um, so it's incumbent on all of us to work hard with the regulators to make sure that we understand the regulatory environment, that we highlight issues early where we see potential problems, and that we develop a shared agenda for the future. 
And if it's not enough to see all this regulation changing, then we're also in a position at the moment where the whole, um, the whole set of rules are changing fundamentally as well. So in insurance, uh, we're seeing changes to the, the capital environment through Solvency II, uh, the distribution environment through the Retail Distribution Review. Uh, we've seen changes to our tax regime, our accounting regime, uh, changes in Europe that are bringing changes to the way that we design products, um, and even down to the bare basics of how you price insurance, we'll no longer be able to, cha to charge different rates according to the risk that, that uh, men versus women impose on us. So we're having to come to terms with some really fundamental changes to the way that we operate, and much of that is being driven through regulation. Perhaps, sadly, I have to say, when a group of chief executives within AFM get together, they don't always talk about um, who's doing well in business terms. The, the first port of discussion always seems to be about regulation. Maybe that's my influence, but I like to think it's actually the regulatory influence, influence and the, the sheer volume of things that we're all having to contend with. So if I've got any messages for you today, it's about saying, Regulation is changing at such a rate that everyone needs to find ways to stay on top of it. Uh, we need to work with the regulators because they will need help to get through the tough agenda that they have. We also need to work with them to make sure that we understand exactly what regulation is doing so that we can adapt accordingly. Thank you.